So in this lesson on classification, we're going to look at the issues that surround defining uh, what a species actually is and why it's hard to assign organisms to a particular species. We'll look at how gel electrophoresis, DNA sequencing and bioinformatics can be used to help with classification. And we're also going to look at how scientific journals and the peer review process and scientific conferences work in order to validate new scientific evidence for evolution uh, and the idea of how science works more generally. So this brings us to the question, if the species is the lowest form of classification, how do we define exactly what a species is? Okay, When you've discovered a species, how do you know it's a new species? How many species have become extinct? These are all really important questions. You know, if we look at these dogs, for example, uh, they all look to me like separate species. You know, they're very, very different. Their morphology is very diff different. However, what we know is that they're actually all variants or breeds of the same species, um, the dog. Okay, so this is how uh, this is where we need to come up with what we define a species as. Now you can define it as what we call the biological species concept, which is that a group of organisms with similar characteristics that interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Okay. Now, in a lot of cases, this way of defining a species works really well. It's certainly better than the way that Linnaeus came up with it, which was just looking at physical features and whether they were in common. Okay? But there are some limitations to the using the biological species concept. For example, um, you know, sometimes populations are geographically separated and cannot interbreed, but they are the same species. But because you know, our definition was interbreed to produce fertile offspring, they're separated and they can't do that. They don't, they don't fit into that definition. Sometimes separate species can mate to produce fertile offspring. So if they're separate species, how come they can mate and produce fertile offspring? That doesn't quite make sense. And plants often interbreed with different species to produce fertile hybrids. Um, many organisms do not reproduce sexually at all. And therefore, how do you define those in terms of their species if they can't reproduce and produce fertile offspring? Fossil organisms, we need to define those, but they can't reproduce. And what about bacteria, which don't interbreed at all? So the idea of what a species is, is actually a more complicated question than you may originally think, okay? There are many other ways scientists have actually found to define that term species, but they all have their own problems. The most advanced methods involve analyzing DNA, and this is the genetic species model, and proteins, um, and looking at the differences between organisms and their proteins or their DNA. However, this also has issues. For example, collecting DNA can be impossible from some fossils. It must be very exciting to discover a new species, but it can be quite tough to actually decide if you have or not. Is it just new in the area? Was it previously identified but thought to be extinct? Uh, is it a completely new species or just a variation of a current species? This can be really hard to assess without understanding its breeding. Some species look the same, but are actually different. This can be hard to see when looking at fungi and bacteria, for example. Some species look very different, but actually the same. So even you know, discovering an organism and identifying it and deciding whether it's a new species or not has its issues. However, technology can help with this process. So there are different ways that we can use technology to help us identify uh, organisms. What, species, what scientists can do is to analyze key proteins and some or all of an organism's DNA. And this is what we call DNA sequencing. And it can tell you the profile, the DNA profile of an organism and organisms of the same species will have a certain proportion of, their same, of the DNA to be the same. It can also be used to see the evolutionary relationship between organisms, which we call phylogeny. Okay. In 2013, DNA, DNA analysis was used to identify horse meat in beef products. So we can use it to really identify what the organism is. DNA is almost like a barcode for each species. There's a huge amount of data that's being collected all over the world now by sequencing the DNA of different species and putting it into databases. And this 
has led to a whole new area of science called bioinformatics. And one of the coolest ideas to come out of this new field is the concept of this living barcode. Imagine if you could essentially scan an organism live in the field uh, when you're out in the wild and find out everything about it just from your smartphone, for example. Its name, its evolutionary journey, its mating rituals, uh, is it dangerous? You know, you could find out everything about it just by essentially taking a tiny DNA sample and getting an instant readout from that. This is the dream of the International Barcode of Life uh, organization who are working to achieve this through analyzing a specific mitochondrial gene called cytochrome oxidase 1 or CO1. And they currently have managed to create a barcode database of over 100,000 species. One of the key techniques used to analyze DNA for species identification and evolutionary links is called gel electrophoresis. To do gel electrophoresis, first of all, the samples that you need to be analyzed are added to wells or in a special type of gel called an agarose gel, um, along with um, some known samples which we're gonna compare it to. Each sample has been treated with specific enzymes called restriction endonucleases, which have cut the DNA uh, at specific points, making them into smaller chunks. It will always cut the same uh, DNA sample in the same way, into the same size chunks, okay? So when you then turn on an electric current and um, the dye uh, moves through the gel, it will leave behind bands based on the size of these chunks of the DNA. And these fragments will fluoresce under UV light, and that gives us a banding pattern, okay? The DNA fragments move from the negative cathode to the positive anode. The shorter ones move quicker than the longer ones, and it always gives us the same pattern for that same sample of DNA. So if it matches the pattern, we know it is the same, okay? We shine the UV light on it, and that gives us that banding. Here is a phylogenetic tree of life, which has been put together using the DNA analysis to see how closely related species are based on how much of their code they have in common. You will have more DNA in common with species that are more closely related to you in terms of the tree of life. So they can just look at how much percentage of DNA are in common between each species and they can look at how far apart they should be on the tree of life. So this is all to do with sort of the idea of how science works, the idea that science is a never ending cycle. And this topic of classification demonstrates that perfectly. Scientists have ideas or hypotheses, uh, they test them out, other scientists then check their work, this is what we call peer review, new evidence is built into or rejects current understanding which may lead to further new ideas and the process continues. So there's this constant cycle in the, word, in the way that science actually works, in terms of making observations, thinking of interesting questions, then formulating a hypothesis, then uh, developing testable predictions, gathering data, you might need to refine that process a few times, then you get your theory and you make some conclusions and then that will be uh, reviewed by other scientists and tested and then it all feeds around again. When you've done your scientific work, you do have to write it up and you write it up in a special way, uh, in a sort of scientific manner, in a very sort of formulaic uh, process and you submit that to um, one of hundreds of scientific journals that specialize in that particular area of science that you've written about. It will then go through this process, as I mentioned, of something called peer review, where other experts in the field will read it and critique that work to check that it is reliable and valid. And if it is, then the journal will publish your work. And sometimes work will have to be resubmitted many times before it is passed and actually published. Scientists get together regularly at international conferences in their chosen field. And these are big events, usually lasting a week long, um, and they attract hundreds of scientists in that particular area of science. And they, they present their findings and their work, and they share ideas, and they build international relationships and collaborate on projects uh, across the world. And therefore, the scientific community really do work together as a whole in order to move science forward and to make new discoveries. Evolution is a nice example to show how the scientific process never stops. The theory has been around for over 150 years, but scientists are always using new methods to try and find more evidence. And this is built on top of current understanding, uh, like layers on top of each other. Um, using techniques such as DNA analysis or protein analysis and bioinformatics, new evidence is published in journals all the time. 
that here are three good examples of recent findings published in journals that provide new evidence for evolution.